In Amos 8 and verse 1, we begin with the fourth of the five visions at the end of the book of Amos. It says, Thus the Lord God showed me, Behold, a basket of summer fruit. Now the basket of summer fruit is the last of the fruit. It's ripe and it's soon there's not going to be any more in the land. So in verse 2, it says, And he said, Amos, what do you see? So I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, the end has come upon my people Israel. I will not pass by them anymore. So the summer fruit is the fruit that is soon to perish. It's ripe for being picked off. And this is the implication of this last vision as it applies to the people of Israel, is that their end would come soon. And one of the things that you know, I mentioned in passing is that in the Hebrew, the word for the end and summer fruit are very, very similar. So this seems to be a play on words here to get the point across more so in the Hebrew than I think we would see here in English. But God then says, he makes it very clear. He says, I will not pass by them anymore. So God's saying that he has given them ample time and that time is up. So he will do what he said he was going to do, and he's going to execute his judgment for cause on his people Israel. In verse 3, it continues and says, And the songs of the temple shall be wailing in that day, says the Lord God. Many dead bodies everywhere, they shall be thrown out in silence. And God, God had warned them previously in Amos 5.23. He says, you know, take away from me the noise of your songs. And so God had warned them about that because in the temple, again, it was a false temple. It wasn't his temple. It was a one with false worship and paganism. And again, things that they had conjured up themselves. And so these songs were not songs of legitimate praise. But of course, now they're going to be turned into wailing. And again, this would be in this false temple, one that they used to worship Baal in. Also, again, it mentions the bodies, the dead bodies that are thrown out in silence, no doubt from the invading army that would be would soon come upon them. And also, it may very well tie into Amos 6, 9, and 10 that we read before. And I won't uh, bother to go back there at the moment. You can go check that out. But it's the one where they said, hold your tongue, you know, do not mention the name of the Lord in terms of all the uh, the dead bodies in the house. So now in verses four through six, God is telling them now the reasons that he is going to do what he is going to do. So in Amos eight and verse four, it says, hear this, you who swallow up the needy and make the poor of the land fail. So they didn't look after the poor and the needy like they were supposed to. And instead, they continued to oppress these disenfranchised people, their brothers, in fact. And we're going to see to what extent they actually do this in Amos uh, verse 8 and verse 6 here in just a couple of verses. But they were well aware of the injunctions to take care of these people. You might put Deuteronomy 15, 11 in your notes. And he just said, look, the poor are always going to be with you in the land. It says, you need to open your hand wide to your brother, to the poor, to the needy people in your land. So God you know, says that those who are blessed have a responsibility to look after their brethren, the ones who are not, for whatever reason, as fortunate as they are. So they knew this. This was written there in the Torah, in the law in the, the book that they had been given by God. But now they turned their back on it. They were not doing it. So in verse five, it says, saying, when will the new moon pass? When will the new moon be passed that we may sell grain and the Sabbath that we may trade wheat, making the ephah small and the shekel large, falsifying the scales by deceit. So again, instead of you know taking care of the people, here they are sitting in on the new the new moon and the Sabbath, and this is what they're thinking about. And again, this new moon that they're talking about could very well be the only holy day, the Feast of Trumpets, that falls on a new moon because new moon because uh, of the fact that 
this is falls in the harvest season and is talking about them selling the grain that they've harvest. So this was a holy convocation in which they were to be doing any servile work. And also it was talking about the Sabbath as well. So the new moons and the Sabbath. And it was also a day in which they were to be ceasing from their works, their ways, their pleasures, their words, the burdens of life. Instead, they should have been engaging in God's works, God's ways, God's pleasures, God's words, worshiping and honoring God, fellowshipping with their brethren, you know, coming before God, doing good within the, these guidelines. And it was a day for, of freedom and liberation from having to do their things, yet this was their focus. So they, instead of you know, preparing to keep this day holy. Instead, they were plotting and planning how to make money by taking advantage of their brethren. And when we say brethren, they're brothers. These are their blood brothers. The 12 tribes were all originally blood brothers. Okay, they all had, uh, it was Abraham, Isaac, then Jacob. You know, they all had Jacob as their father. So God adds this then, this, again, the way that they were keeping the new moon and the Sabbath in particular here to this litany of other sins that they were going into slavery for. And, and one of the things, again, just to finish out this verse is that they're talking about making the ephah small and the shekel large. They were not honest about their weights and measures. They were giving less than what was, they were, than what was purchased and they were devaluing their currency with heavier than advertised weight. So in other words, they're using a smaller basket while saying it was the full ephah and a counterweight that is heavier than advertised. So the buyer would pay more for a lesser amount of a bad quality product. And we're going to see that in uh, the next verse. And again, if this is not obvious, if it's not, if the deceitfulness of this action or interactions is something that they actually don't know or don't understand or just wouldn't actually, you know, say, okay, let me apply this to myself and say, this is not something I should do. Well, Deuteronomy 25 verses 13 through 16 makes it very, very plain that yes, you're not supposed to be doing this. And in fact, in verse 15, it says that your days may be lengthened in the land. So it says, you shall have a perfect and just weight, a perfect and just measure, that your days may be lengthened in the land. Well, guess what? They were not doing that. And now, because of this, their days were going to be shortened in the land with the impending captivity that is going to be imposed upon them by the Assyrians. So continue on in Amos 8 and verse 6, it says, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, even sell the bad wheat. So the vendors took so much from these that didn't have much to begin with, even to the point that they were forced into slavery for the sake of a small price. And they were giving them this bad wheat. So in addition to the, the deceptive weights and measures, it was this below average product. So then we continue here with what God is going to tell them what he is going to do to them for acting, uh, acting in the way that they've been acting, for committing these sins against God, for doing wrong against what God instructed them to do. So verse seven, it says, the Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their works. So now here it is, the Lord sworn for the third time as he's done in this book. The first was by his holiness in, in chapter four and verse two, and then by himself in chapter six and verse eight. And yet that was not enough to motivate the Israelites to change. That God's saying, I, because I cannot swear by anything greater than this, I, to say that, yes, I'm going to do this. You know, perhaps now I can hit a little bit closer to home. You know, And again, those the first two should have been more than enough and yet here he is now talking about the pride of Jacob. So this was perhaps more meaningful to them than God and would get them to change their ways. It seems unlikely, but he says in speaking of their works, 
He says that, that they were proud of what they, quote unquote, had accomplished and the wealth and power that they had built. When the reality was, it was that God had blessed them and had facilitated all of it. Now, because of their hubris, God targets their materialism that meant so much to them that it was a source of their pride. They had felt that everything that they had done and accumulated and their power in the land and the, you know, the, the fact that they had been protected and now they have this prime piece of real estate, that it was largely in part due to what they had done. And God had said back in, in Amos and six in verse eight, you know, when he was talking about swearing by himself, he says, I abhor the pride of Jacob and hate his palaces. Therefore I will deliver up the city and all that's in it. So God brought this to fruition, right? He's now talking about swearing by the, the pride of Jacob and that he's not going to forget their works. Again, when he says he's not going to forget them, he's going to, again, there's going to be retribution against the things that they valued, which really didn't mean as much, and they didn't produce in and of themselves as they falsely believed. And sure enough, that came to happen whenever Jerusalem as a whole was delivered up. Uh, well, I, I should say as the Northern Kingdom was delivered up to uh, the Assyrians. Now in verse eight of Amos, Amos eight, verse eight, shall the land not tremble for this and everyone mourn who dwells in it? All of it shall swell like the river, heave and subside like the river of Egypt. Again, he was asking this rhetorically, like this type of event was to be expected by the people. They actually had a warning. I noticed some two years after the prophecy was given that this would happen. Again, in Amos 1.1, it said that uh, in introducing basically the the book of Amos in the chapter, it puts the time as two years before the earthquake. So there was obviously this notable earthquake that happened. And here it is now in chapter eight, it says, you know, shall the land not tremble for this? For, you know, again, for all the stuff that's preceded this, and in particular, just the first verse before this. So again, this happened and this act of God should have been a, you know, correlated to the way that they're acting and as a way of getting their attention. And then he goes on to talk about the swelling of the river. And he's speaking of this annual flooding of the Nile. That's the river of Egypt. And it was an allusion to the Assyrian army that would invade them because they refused to repent. You know, you put um, Jeremiah 46 verses 7 and 8 Again, if you want to see the correlation between flooding and a military incursion, again, it, it very specifically says, who is this coming up like a flood? Right. So talking about, in this case, it was Egypt that rises like a flood and moves like the rivers to destroy the city and inhabitants. And of course, that's not the only place. But the point is that the flood is very often used as an allusion to invading military army. In this case, if you want to, you can look at Isaiah 8 and verse 7, which more or less gives us the interpretation here so that we don't have to come up with our own guesses as what it means when it says swell like the river and heave and subside like the river of Egypt. In Isaiah 8 and verse 7, it says, now therefore, behold, the Lord brings up over them the waters of the river, strong and mighty, the king of Assyria and all his glory, he will go up over all his channels and go over all his banks. Again, it, it makes a very direct reference to the flood being, in this case, the Assyrian army that would then come into the land. Of course, we get to speak by virtue of the fact that this has already happened in the past and that it was going to come to, to fruition later after Amos had given them this warning. But nonetheless, we have the interpretation there as to what Amos is warning them about and the, the type of imagery he's invoking there. 
So in Amos 8 and verse 9, continuing, it says, And it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord God, that I will make the sun go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in broad daylight. So again, it says it shall come to pass. It's another clear indicator that we're talking about the end time as well. So even though we're talking about in the 700 BCs that these things are happening, the ancient fulfillment, we see that it has a fulfillment in the end time. So it talks about this. And again, these are other end time events that we should be very well aware of. But the sun will go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. These are the heavenly signs that accompany the events in the latter days. In Matthew 24 and verse 29, just a single verse so I can read it to you. It says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And Joel has, again, very similar prophecies throughout it. And I'll put the, the verses in the on the website, but Joel 2.2, 2.10, 2.31, 3, verses 14 and 15, all talk about similar events. So in Amos 8 and verse 10, he says, I will turn your feast into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on every waist and baldness on every head. I will make it like mourning for an only son and it's in like a bitter day. Again, he was talking about your feast, not his feast. When you look at Leviticus 23, it's very clear that God says, these are my feasts. These are not just the feast for the Jews. It's not the Jews' feast. It's his feast, the feast of the Lord. And here, and this was part of the problem, was that they had replaced God's command of feast days with their own. And so now they, a time of mourning is going to come on them. And this goes hand in hand with the lamenting songs at the beginning of this chapter in uh, verse three, but it shows the people mourning and they have the sackcloth on and the baldness. These are all the outward signs of repentance. Again, God don't doesn't want just the outward show. Again, often it begins that way and it's an immature kind of worldly sorrow that, oh, they're lamenting the position that they're in, but God wants this turning of the inward man to repent, to change thoroughly, to say, okay, yes, that way is so wrong. I acknowledge that and I can see that I shouldn't do that and there's reasons for not doing that and I should do what's right. But nonetheless, God had to do this to get their attention and it's going to be so bad that, you know, it's, it's going to be like their only son had died. You know, their namesake, their heir apparent is taken and it's their only one and there's not much worse that I don't think that can be taken from you in many ways as a parent. So continuing on in verse 11 of Amos 8, it says, and we'll read verse 12 as well. It says, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east, and they shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. So again, obviously, and I say obviously it should be by now, that this is speaking of the end time. When it says, behold, the days are coming. This is what this phrase references. He says, I will send a famine on the land. Now, God's going to allow these things to come about before he brings his feast of his word at his second coming. And so there's going to be this contrast. <clears throat> you know, again, we, we typically look at these types of scriptures uh, during the Feast of Tabernacles, where, where it talks about the earth being full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So again, he's going to bring these things about for his reason at his time. But to me, it seems to be, okay, this is what's going to happen right before he comes. And it's just the way that it's going to be as he sets up the events of the end time. He's not necessarily going to be blessing the world 
with his word. There comes a time when, okay, God will remove himself because of their sins. But this word, this uh, hearing of the word, this family of the hearing of the word is speaking of the truth specifically. The truth will be in short supply. Okay, we can't confuse this with the fact that there's going to be all these assorted churches out there with a different spirit preaching another Jesus or another gospel that Paul warned us about. The truth is, is that there's going to be many false Christs and false prophets deceiving most of the people with their lies and doing great signs and wonders. That's going to be happening, but we cannot be confusing that with the word of the Lord, which is the truth. And of course, if we tie this back in with verse nine, again, we see the physical pointing to the spiritual. This, these conditions of darkness and no light that come upon the Israelites in the end time is going to parallel their spiritual condition because they refuse to hear or obey the word of God. And so like Isaiah 55 verse six says, you know, he's going to hide himself from them. And all of these things are, are curses also for disobedience. In Romans 28, verses 28 and 29, again, the blessing and cursings chapter, where, you know, again, I think it's around verse 15, it says, okay, now, if you disobey, this is what's going to happen. So he starts off with the blessings, but then he says, if you disobey, and one of the curses for disobedience was will be that the Lord will strike you with madness and blindness and confusion of heart. And you shall grope at noonday as a blind man gropes in the darkness and you shall not prosper in your ways and you shall be only oppressed and plundered continually and no one shall save you. So they did not seek God while he could be found and now it was too late. And he's hidden from them because of their sins. You know, Isaiah 59 verses one and two talks about that. So now they have lost the truth. They've lost access to the truth and they grasp for whatever they can hold on to. And that is only falsehood that they seek and find. And to me, this very aptly describes what's going on today in this present evil age, as the Bible calls it. So I think we really need to see how applicable this is and all these other prophecies are for the time that we are living in and that will soon be upon us. And of course, take heed and hear these words. You know, Do not shut your ears or your eyes to what is being said. And of course, act accordingly. So Amos 8 and verse 13, it says, In that day, fair virgins and strong young men shall faint from thirst. So this is how bad it's going to be. It's going to be, if it's going to be that way for them, it's going to be really bad for the old and weak then. In verse 14 says, Those who swear by the sin of Samaria, which is idolatry, who say, As your God lives, O Dan, and as the way of Beersheba lives, they shall fall and never rise again. Again, this Dan to Beersheba was terminology that kind of meant the whole land from north to south. And he's talking about as your God lives. Again, and it, it, it proper, properly, properly uses a little g, a small case g for God, which again is no God. And it's because of the, they chose the pagan gods, which are not gods. And they're, ways, the God's quote unquote, ways over the true God and his ways. And this is why they're being taken into captivity. And then the, the chapter and this verse ends with, they shall fall and never rise again. To me, this is very evident that this is a prophecy for the end time. It points to this time in the kingdom of God on earth which will then usher in the rule of Christ. And it's going to be this time where this will never happen again. That paganism, idolatry, going after false ways will never be allowed to take hold and flourish because God is going to set up 
his government. He's going to rule. He's going to be this omniscient, omnipresent God that can and will affect change in his people. And there will be no hiding from him. And again, he won't be hidden in the corners anymore. And so it actually you know, ends on a good note. It looks forward to this time when those things and all the sins of Israel will no longer be the standard as they were then and as they are even today. So then chapter nine, which is the fifth and final vision in the last chapter of the book of Amos, it begins with, I saw the Lord standing by the altar and he said, strike the doorposts that the thresholds may shake and break them all in the heads of them all. I will slay the last of them with the sword. He who flees from them shall not get away and he who escapes from them shall not be delivered. So in this final fifth vision, we see God standing by the altar. It's no longer Jeroboam standing there and overseeing the rituals, but now it's God and he's doing just the opposite that Jeroboam was doing. And now he's dismantling the whole system. You can put 1 Kings 12 verses 26 through well, I go all the way to chapter 13 and verse one, and you can see what Jeroboam had instituted in terms of uh, worship. Now, whenever the, the, the tribes or the, the nation of Israel split and he became the king of the northern 10 tribes. And one of the things, the first things he did was to put into place a, a new system of worship where they were now keeping the Feast of Tabernacles on the eighth month in the 15th day, as opposed to the seventh month and 15th day. And he did it with all his own priest and his own worship. And, and one of the things though, that in that set of scriptures that's made clear was that Jeroboam, again, and you put, uh, first Kings 13, one, uh, he says that, that, uh, then Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. So you see that now God's making the point, okay, that he's going to now get rid of Jeroboam, and this is what he's going to do with it all. So it re represents, again, this vision represents the destruction of the temple in Bethel, along with this idolatrous and pagan ways. And God says, I'm going to slay the last of them. There's some, though, that he sets aside as a remnant that have gone into captivity that will survive. We'll see that a little bit later. But... Uh, they're going to be those who think that they can escape. And God just says, nope. And he's going to elaborate just how unfruitful it will be to resist the plan of God that once it's already set in motion. Verse two of chapter nine says, though they dig into hell from there, my hand shall take them though. They climb up to the heaven from there. I will bring them down. So again, here they are. They think that they might be able to escape the destruction. They may have escaped this or that and think, oh, I have a chance. But God says, you know, they're not going to escape the grasp of God from the lowest to the highest points, from heaven to hell. And again, again, hell being the grave and heaven is either the first or second, which again, at the time, you know, they couldn't escape into the second heaven. But uh, we do have that potential today, though. And again, I think people are always talking about, okay, maybe we can go to the moon or to Mars. But the reality is, is that it's not the third heaven and there is nowhere outside the reach of the arm of God. In verse three, it says, and though they hid, uh, though they hide themselves on top of Carmel. So he's continuing with the fact that, yeah, you're just not going to get away. From there, I will search and take them, though they hide from my sight at the bottom of the sea. From there, I will command the serpent and it shall bite them. So God's going to see them even in the darkness. You know, Carmel had thousands of caves to hide in. Of course, you can go back in there and, you know, you can, there's a thousand of them, which seems like a, a lot, not to God, obviously. And that they can go back in the recesses and not be seen. But again, God will see. And even the bottom of the sea where the light does not reach. 
He says, no, I have ways of getting you even down there. So you're not going to escape what is coming. This was true for them back then. And it's true to this day. No matter what you think, whether you're trying to go off to wherever Montana and be a prepper or buy your own little private island and have your own uh, storage of food and guns and whatnot, you're not going to be able to save yourself from what is coming by means of your own power and strength is only by you know, living by every word of God that any of this can possibly happen. Verse four, though they go into captivity before their enemies, from there I will command the sword and it shall slay them. I will set my eyes on them for harm and not for good. So death and enslavement from the invading armies are a punishment from God and it will come to happen. It will come to fruition. Verse five, the Lord God of hosts, he who touches the earth and it melts, and all who dwell there mourn, all of it shall swell like the river and subside like the river of Egypt. So the Lord God of host, he, okay, this is the main difference between this verse and, and uh, chapter eight, verse eight, which had a very uh, similar type of, of phrasing here. But here it's made very clear that it is God that will be sending the Assyrian army as a punishment on his people for their continued sins. And again, I, I'm not going to comment any more on that. You can go look at what we said in, in chapter 8 and verse 8 in terms of the army being this flood that's going to come in and go out over the whole land. And again, God says, I'm going to make sure nobody escapes. So Amos 9, verse 6, he says, He who builds his layers in the sky and has founded his strata in the earth, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth, the Lord is his name. You know, God has the ability and, again, to control all of these things. And the fact that he can is illustrated here by the command, by his command of every facet of this world. So he can do all these things and it's beyond, some of this stuff is, is beyond even our scope to say, okay, how can it even be controlled or manipulated or how can this be done? Of course, God acts outside of the physical. He has complete control of all these things, even to the point where he calls for the waters of the sea to be poured out on the earth. So he has the ability to bring rain in that way. Again, we know how that works through so the evaporative process. It goes up in the sky and then the clouds become saturated and rains. And he can do that and bring rain in due season. Or he can flood the earth as in the time of Noah. Or he can send out an army to completely cover the land. It's saying that all these things are within the purview of God. And that... Again, we always need to be aware and we can never underestimate the power and resolve of God to do what he says he's going to do. Verse seven, are you not like the people of Ethiopia to me? O children of Israel, says the Lord, did I not bring up Israel from the land of Egypt, the Philistines from Kaftor and the Syrians from Kir? So the, the point that God's making is that they're not entirely special, the people of Israel. And he illustrates this in two ways in this verse. He says, one, you're acting sinfully like the Ethiopians who are idolatrous and worldly. You know, you're just like them in that way. So you're not special just because. It's not just because I called you out and I gave you my word. It's the fact that you need to live by that word is that's going to make you this, this special and peculiar people to me that I entered into this covenantal relationship with. But no, the point he's making, nope, you're, you're just like the Ethiopians in, in that way. And number two, he says, you're not the only one that I've ever saved from captivity. He says, you know, I did that. Okay. And it was all part of my plan and purpose. Of course, you know, I'm 
orchestrating everything in the world right now. This is what God's saying. This is how he makes prophecy come to pass. And so, you know, I did this for the, the Philistines and for the, the Syrians as well. And, and I did it for you. So again, that doesn't make you special just because I did that. You don't get to act however you want either just because you think that you're special and you've accumulated all these things and I've been with you. And again, you've rejected all that. So he's just saying, even though you were set apart for this special reason and purpose, it doesn't make you beyond reproach, especially considering all the things that Amos has been bringing up to you up to this point. Also, as a, a side note, I think we had addressed this earlier, but in Amos 1, 5, it talks about, you know, the people of Syria will go captive to Kir. So again, the prophecy is is always going to happen, as God says, unless people repent and then, you know, it may be, you know, God would would relent to do what he's doing, which again, he said, even in this book to Amos and to his people, and again, the purpose of Amos going there was to get the people to repent. So God that would not have to do it, but God knew too well who they were and what they were and, and why they were going to do what they were going to do. Now, in the next two verses here, we see some of the events that have yet to be fulfilled. So we talk about some of these things being dual in terms of having an ancient fulfillment and a future one. But then there's some things that are talked about that, again, they give us this hint that how we know it's prophecy is because they haven't happened yet. And so we know that they are still yet to happen. In Amos 9, in verse 8, it says, Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are on the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from the face of the earth, yet I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, says the Lord. So God can and will do this to the nations and others, the ones in the, the previous verse. You know, Jeremiah 30, verse 7 says, Alas, for that day is great, there is none like it, and it is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he will be saved out of it. And then verse 9, it says, For surely I will command and will sift the house of Israel among all nations, as grain is sifted in a sieve, yet not the smallest grain shall fall to the ground. So he's going to sift the house of Israel among all nations. This has not yet happened in the past. Israel went into captivity by the hand of Assyria only. And after that, after they were released, they did go to some relatively unpopulated areas of Europe, but that doesn't carry the intensity of sifting. And so this has not yet been fulfilled. It's still to happen in the future. And we did some messages on the coming captivity of the houses of Israel and Judah, which I suggest you can go look at and see it this uh, more thoroughly and in depth. But in Isaiah 11, verses 11 through 12, Isaiah 11, verses 11 through 12, it shows about this sifting of Israel where it will go into captivity among many nations. Isaiah 11, verses 11 and 12, it says, It shall come to pass in that day, again, future setting, that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time, first time was when they were in captivity in Egypt, to recover the remnant of his people who are left, the ones who have not died, his people who are left, okay, now it begins to enumerate where they are. So from Assyria and Egypt, so from you know, modern day Germany and the Germanic peoples, from Pathros, which is like Egypt and or India, Kush, which is North Africa, Ethiopia, Sri Lanka, India, and uh, from Elam, which is Iran, and Shinar, that's the former Babylon, now Iraq, from Hamath, which is this region of around ancient Babylon or uh, a designation for Ham, whose descendants are among the Egyptians, Arabs, Ethiopians, North Africans, the Palestinians, and the Libyans, 
and the islands of the sea. And he's got to set up this banner. And will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Again, put Isaiah 27 verses 12 and 13 in there as well. So what we see is that these people are going to be in captivity and that God is going to sift them among the whole world, not just Assyria. So this is not yet to happen yet. And again, we know many of the prophecies of Israel coming back to the land of Israel. Again, the, the kingdom of Israel, the northern ten tribes of Israel coming back to the land of Israel. And that hasn't happened yet. Right now, it's just the modern Jews that are there. But he talks about not the smallest grain that shall fall to the ground. And I think that this is somewhat misleading in that you know, this is the only word, only place where this word is translated grain and can be found. It has more of the connotation of a pouch full or a bundle. could be even a, a pebble. But when a grain is sifted, such as wheat, it's the impurities that are left behind in the sieve. And so this verse is saying that not a single bad thing will get through the sieve or accidentally kind of bounce off the top while it's being shaken and jerked all back and forth in the process of, of sifting the grain. So he's saying that, yeah, there's not going to be a, a, a single bad element that's going to make it through. So it's, it's not like there's this, this special care that's being taken to nurture them. It's a special care that's being taken to make sure that the punishment is... Uh, fully administered and just. So continuing on in verse 10 of Amos 9, it says, All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, who say the calamity shall not overtake nor confront us. So all the sinners of my people, they, they believe that they are not bad. When in actuality, they just do not see how glaringly wrong that their ways are again, because now they're saying the calamity won't confront or overtake us. They're saying, they're saying that this can or will not happen to us. You know, you can put yourself in their shoes and again, be a good thing to do, especially at this point in time in our history, but they are in ancient, ancient Israel. Amos comes in and says, all these things are going to happen because you guys are this way, that way, and the other way. And they, just like we do today, justify and say, no, that, that's, that, I, I don't believe you. I don't see that. No, you're just saying that. And yeah, we're, we're not really that bad because, you know, it's what's in my heart that really counts or whatever uh, kind of, you know, saying or belief or dismissive type of retort that they want to reply with. This is exactly what's going on today. If, if this message were to go out to everyone today, right, to tell them, okay, this is going to come across, come upon the people of the United States and the United Kingdom and the rest of the, the peoples of Israel and Judah, if they don't repent because of what they're doing right now is so wrong, they're, they're going to go, no, 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 you don't know what you're talking about. That's just this, that, or the, that's just some ancient text. Text. It doesn't apply to us today. You know, we, we get to kind of do whatever's right in our own minds, et cetera, et cetera. Then, yeah, I think we, we'd have a very good idea of what the people of ancient Israel were thinking and saying at the same time when Amos was prophesying this. And yet, you know, we look at today and, and Jeremiah 6 verse 14 says, you know, you know they say peace, peace, when there is no peace. And they don't see these things coming upon us. They're not staying aware and alert. And they lack this situational awareness of how things are coming together and how the world is on the precipice of this house of cards just being ready to fall down as soon as that one significant card is taken out. Also, they're, they lack this spiritual self-awareness as well. You know, when Revelation 3.17 talks about this end-time attitude where everybody thinks that they are 
rich, rich and wealthy and have need of nothing. And in actuality, they're just the opposite. And so everybody doesn't have a firm grasp on who and what they are and how the situation lies. But all these things will happen. And, but in the end, it's going to be for a purpose that God is working out something here on earth so that, again, everybody will come around and, and see what it is that God's doing and what he wants of them and that they will have this, this new mind and this new heart and this spirit within them. And Israel will eventually be restored. And so he ends the book of Amos chapter nine on a positive note. So beginning in verse 11 through the end, we see what will eventuate with Israel. In verse 11, it says, on that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down and repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. Again, another reference to the futures when he says on that day or in that day, it's the end time, the latter days. It says the tabernacle of David. Here it's speaking of the house of David, which is of all Israel who are united under him as one at that time. It was uh, afterwards and after Solomon that they, they split. And of course, this can't actually refer to the actual tabernacle in the wilderness. This never fell, but it was replaced with the, the temple that Solomon was allowed to bend uh, to build. So again, it doesn't refer to an actual uh, tabernacle and it doesn't refer to David. As we see, this is all a reference to in these chapters, the, the restoration of Israel. It's talking about uh, Israel as a whole and as a whole. And we see that uh, more clearly here in verse 12 in just a second. But it says he's going to repair, raise up, rebuild. So it's figuratively speaking of this restoration of Israel, which again, now we see in verse 12, it says that they may possess, they being Israel, may possess the remnant of Edom, all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does this thing. So again, during this restoration, there's going to be now this possession of the remnant of Edom. Again, this, this is interesting too, that Edom is used here of, of all the people. And it's like, why just specifically focus on them? And we address this a little bit in the book of Ob Obadiah, which again is one whole book that is dedicated to quote unquote Edom. And what we see here is that Edom represents the Gentiles. And it even alludes to that in this verse when it says Edom and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, again, thrown together. Of course, Edom was not a part of Israel. And it's now saying, okay, what we're saying here is that this is the rest of mankind. So Esau was the twin, Esau and Edom are the same. And Esau was the twin brother of Jacob or Israel. And he became the enemy of God's people. Okay, so God's people who are the descendants of Israel. So you have Abraham, Isaac. Isaac had twin boys, Jacob and Esau. Jacob's lineage became the Israelites. And Edom's lineage went and actually married up with Ishmael and became more the antagonist in this, uh, this story of, of how God worked with his people. So you had Israel, God's people, and Esau not God's people, the antagonist in the situation. So what we're seeing here then is that it becomes, that Edom becomes emblematic for everyone else, all the Gentiles. In fact, let's just look at that and we'll just prove it kind of here real quick. In Acts 15, verses 13 through, we'll go all the way down to 19. But we have James who is actually quoting this verse. So he's quoting Amos here when he says, again, trying to settle the dispute 
at Jerusalem in Acts 15, he says, and after they had become silent, James answered and said, men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared, this is Peter, how God at first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. So the Gentiles are being called, and he did that through Cornelius in Acts 10. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as is written. So this was already declared to be something that was going to happen, right? That, 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 would, that they would become a people of God, that they weren't the people of God, but they would become the people of God. In verse 16, and here's where he quotes Amos, he says, after this, I, after this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its, its ruins. I will set it up so that the rest, the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things known to God from eternity. Here are all his works. So now did you notice how James said, it? he says the rest of mankind. So instead of Edom or Esau there, okay, he says the rest of mankind. So he equates now the rest of mankind with Edom here. And he says, okay, even all the Gentiles, who are called by my name. So now we're talking about the Gentiles who are being called, who are being set apart, who now, or, okay, well, let me just finish up verse 19 of Acts 15, because again, it's the Gentiles who are called by my name, and he says, they're continuing, he says, therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those who are among the Gentiles who are turning to God. So, so this is the prophecy, again, starting to be fulfilled and will be completely fulfilled in the very end when God pours out his spirit on everyone. And as Romans 2, 28 and 29 says that you become a Jew inwardly. Okay. You are a spiritual Jew when your heart is circumcised. So whenever you receive God's spirit and you change and you become more godly, you become a spiritual Jew. So in that way, the Gentiles who are not the people of God at one time, along with Edom, Esau, then now have this opportunity to become the people of God here. And thou, now whenever it talks about in Amos 9, 12, that they must possess the remnant of Edom and all of the Gentiles, right? Is that, now they're all going to become part of this Israel of God and God will be the ruler. He will be the King of King, the Lord of Lords and all the kingdoms of the earth will become his and they will all become his people. So again, God is not a respecter of persons and he's going to eventually bring everyone into his fold, just as he is doing today. All the people of God today are not physical Israelites. You know, God has begun since the time of, of, um, of Peter in the first meeting with Cornelius that, again, he is calling them to be his people. So continuing on in verse 13, says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows seeds. The mountains shall drip with sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. I mean, what a wonderful time when the yield is going to be so tremendous that it appears it's going to take like over half a year just to reap what they have sown. God's going to, again, teach people his ways. They're going to be blessed because of it. He's going to give rain in due season and the, the bounty of the crops is going to be unimaginable so much so that it seems that the hills are going to be flowing with the grapes and the wine that comes from it, and the grape juice, the sweet wine. And he says, verse 14, I will bring back the captives of my people, Israel. They shall build the way cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them. They shall also make gardens and eat fruit from them. 
again, he says, I'm going to, again, this is in the very end time. We have to see this and understand that these people will go into captivity in the future. In this scenario, God will have to free them. And this is still yet to happen. And it's going to be a part of this restoration of Israel. Isaiah 27, verses 12 and 13. Yes, that's what I, the verse I was alluding to from before in Isaiah 11, 11 and 12, all this you know, goes together hand in hand. In Isaiah 27 and verse 12, it says, and it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will thresh from the channel of the river to the brook of Egypt, and you will be gathered one by one, O you children of Israel. So it shall be in that day, again, in the end time, the great trumpet will be blown, they will come who are about to perish in the land of Assyria and they who are outcasts in the land of Egypt and they shall worship the Lord in the holy mount at Jerusalem. So he's bringing them back and they're going to now after the day of the Lord in his time of wrath on all the people for being sinful, for going too far, for not doing what they're supposed to do, for leaving God is, is again, now all the destruction is going to be rebuilt. And it's going to be a time of peace and prosperity. It's going to be like paradise, like the Garden of Eden upon the whole earth. And, you know, you can put Ezekiel 36, verses 10 and 11 in your notes, talking about how... Again, people begin to to uh, prosper and, and rebuild the cities and inhabit them, and the ruins are going to be rebuilt, and people are going to start having families, and it's going to be a time of unprecedented peace. And he says, finally, in verse fifteen, I will plant them in their land. Okay, and no longer shall they be pulled up from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. So they're going to be planted firmly and they're not going to be uprooted. And again, the illusion is much to, in the same way that he was talking about in verse 14, that they're planted and that they're going to be fruitful. And I think we should make this clear that this didn't happen in 1948 as a lot of people, I think, believe when Israel, quote unquote, was made a state, mainly for two reasons. It's, it's only It was only the house of Judah that returned, not the northern kingdom. And also, as we've seen, the Jews are going to be removed along with the rest of Israel, the t northern 10 tribes where they scattered to, the quote unquote, lost 10 tribes. God knows who they are. He keeps track of everybody. But the Jews are going to be uprooted from this land. God says, no, there's a time coming when they shall no longer be pulled up, that they're going to have this peace and prosperity. That's not going on right now. It's a powder keg in the Middle East. But these things are happening because as Amos went on through, again, God through Amos has told his people that it's because of your sins, because you have rejected me, because you have refused to do the things I've said, that these punishments will come upon you to bring about repentance. And then after that, and then when I return, there's going to be an unprecedented time that is never before seen after the unprecedented bad time. But now God will then usher in his thousand year reign on earth and the people will be blessed and, and they will prosper. And it will all be because God is here and everyone is living by his ways.